Welcome to the France 24 debate. The situation in Guinea is our focus in this edition. I'm Mark Owen in Paris. The military coup saw President Alpha Conde arrested and detained. Colonel Amamadi Dumboya emerged as the face of the new military leaders. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres reacted by slamming the taking of power at gunpoint. Neighboring states followed this lead, adding their condemnation and followed the West African Economic Group ECOWAS and the African Union. Well, Colonel Dumboya has announced there will be a government of national unity and a swift transition to democratic governance. And today, 10 days later, is the start of a process towards that aim. Our guests will be talking to us uh, through, well, talking us rather through the stakes, through the threats, opportunities, strengths, weaknesses that this presents. Let's introduce you to those guests. Niagali Bagayoko is from the African Security Sector Network. Niagali, thanks for joining us. On the other side of our studio, Dudu Sidibe, who's Professor of Political Science at the University of Gustave Eiffel. Thanks for being with us, sir. My pleasure. Joining us from afar, Abu Bakr Diabe, researcher at the Guinea Political Science Association. Thanks for being with us, sir. And Douglas Yates, professor of African studies at the American Graduate School here in Paris. Douglas, pleasure to see you. James Andre is our correspondent in Conakry. He's awaiting us live. James, set the scene for us. Well, basically what we've been seeing, we've been here for a week now, uh, is that basically a lot of the people of throughout the country we've spoken for are actually backing this coup, uh, which indeed took place on the Sunday, Sunday 5th of September. Now, since that Sunday, we've not heard Mabadi Dumbuya, who is the new strongman here in Guinea, uh, who has been... Uh, Yes, who is the new country strongman, Mamadi Dumbuya, has not spoken publicly uh, since that Sunday, but that is going to change tonight because indeed uh, there has been a speech that has been recorded by the local television here, and that's probably uh, going to be aired at 8 p.m. Now, what's been taking place today at the People's Palace, where I'm standing here in Conakry, is the first step towards a transition government. The idea was to meet all the stakeholders here in the country. These talks are going to last for four days. The fourth, first day has taken place and uh, indeed uh, during this uh, first first day uh, we have three groups that have been uh, invited to meet Mamadi Doumdouya and the junta uh, that is the politicians the religious leaders and the traditional regional leaders of the four provinces that form Guinea now the political leaders was obviously the one that everyone was watching and indeed we could speak to them as they came out uh, we were not allowed to attend the meetings or not even allowed to attend the speech by Mamadi Dumbuya that was the beginning of this meeting now we did speak to uh, the opposition leader Selou Delan Diallo and he told us that basically he felt that he'd been listened to he felt that indeed uh, Mamadi Dumbuya was calm was relaxed. He said that basically his speech was about not personifying power around his own persona. He also said that he wanted transparency. He said uh, that indeed, uh, this is Selou Dalandiello, he said that he found that he spoke openly and frankly. Uh, so basically, uh, the leader of the opposition happy with this first contact with the junta. Now, we do know that Selou Dalandiello was in favor of the coup. He said it over and over again. Now, at the end of this meeting, the junta invited the political leaders to present a memorandum about what they believe is required in Guinea in order to have a smooth transition back to democracy. James Andre in Conakry, thank you very much indeed. James, as he says, been there for a week observing the situation and watching for all developments. Thank you, sir, very much indeed. Let's bring the debate to our studio and bring in first Niagali Bagayoko of the African Security Sector Network. Uh, Niagali, when you hear and see what has been happening, when you know what's at stake, what are your feelings right now about the situation? What is very interesting is uh, to see that uh, there is uh, undoubtedly um, something which is trying to put together and to uh, set up a kind of inclusive approach, I would say, uh, from the very beginning. So this is something which should be seen as a reassuring. Uh, and also the fact that a community uh, from Guinea uh, are uh, brought together because 
one of the defining features of uh, Alpha Conde uh, governance was also is a community-based uh, discourse uh, tending to oppose a different community is a very good sign because uh, what is uh, important to remember is that uh, Mamadi Dumbuya is belonging to the same uh, community group, Malinke, as uh, Alpha Conde. So uh, the fact that uh, Selou and Diallo uh, from Fulani community uh, to be uh, involved in those talks is, in my view, a very positive development. Okay, positive say. new Nyega. Let's cross the studio and bring in Dudu Sidibe, Professor of Political Science at the University of Gustav Eiffel. Good evening, sir. Thanks for being with us. Good evening. Um, essentially, give us your take on the situation, because we've heard from our correspondent in Conakry that things on the surface look like they're pro progressing well. Yeah, I think that things are progressing. Um, I don't know if they are progressing well, but they are progressing. <laughs> so because the, the fact of discussing... That's the difference, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> because the fact of uh, having the will uh, to gather all the stakeholders and to discuss the political parties, uh, youth, uh, women, uh, local and traditional powers, everything put together, uh, everyone put together to discuss and to see how to uh, develop this transition, I think that it's a good thing. So because he had to, to listen, to understand, and then to take a decision. Thank you, sir. Let's bring in uh, Abu Bakr Diabe, researcher at the Guinea Political Science Association, joining us uh, from the US. Uh, Abu Bakr, I hope you can hear me, and I hope you heard what our guests were saying. Uh, pleasure to have you on the programme, and we're looking forward to hearing what you think about the situation, uh, as we've been hearing it from Conakry. Tell us, sir. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you so much. I think the situation, what happening actually in Guinea, is uh, from many like people in Guinea, they think that this was uh, entirely predictable. Because if you look at the social dimension, the political and economic dimension, the country was completely destroyed by, the, by his leaders. So the rising of the military coup in, in, in Guinea right now was a... Uh, was, I think, from my understanding, it was a good move for the country to, to, to move to another chapter of his life. So, from my understanding, the situation of this school was predictable. Abu Bakr, thank you very much indeed. Douglas, I hope you can hear us. Douglas joining us uh, from uh, a part of Paris. Uh, good to see you, sir. It's always a pleasure to have your input on all matters African. And I know you have a particular interest in Guinea. Um, is this, as uh, Abu Bakr was saying, the start of a new chapter, or are we starting a different book? What's your thought? Well, I see this as a cycle, a constantly repeating cycle of coup d'etat. Uh, this is now a, a, an army push by special forces, then mm -hmm. uh, restoration mm -hmm. of civilian rule, followed by a coup d'etat. Um, there was a coup in 1984, and then, uh, and then another coup in 2008, and now in 2021. So the coups, the cycles are more frequent. They're happening more frequently now. Uh, the last coup was, you know, a dozen years ago. The next one probably will be in six years. Douglas, thank you very much indeed. Nia Ghali, can I bring you back in? Douglas talking about a kind of cycle that's happening. Clearly in neighboring countries, I'm thinking Mali, Chad, We've seen similar kinds of moves, uh, which may be in some way indicative of some sort of pattern across the region. Yes. What is also important to say, I think, is what is a coup? Is a coup only military mm. or can a coup be civilian as well? And the problem that we do have today in Guinea is that we do have two illegitimate <laughs> leaders who are uh, at stake uh, because uh, what happened in the country is uh, the fact that uh, Alpha Conde has been running for a third term uh, whilst it was not allowed initially by the constitutions. So uh, it was very problematic to see that there was no real reaction against this from institutional uh, multilateral African organizations such as the African Union and ECOVAS. And as you're just mm. saying, uh, 
what happened uh, in Chad, in my view, is a real precedent because when uh, the former leader, uh, Idris Deby, uh, passed away, uh, he, was, uh, uh, he, he was replaced by a, a junta led by the, our son. And it was the first time that the African Union took no real sanction against the country. There has been a kind of validation of this coup. And it was more or less logical that uh, other countries look at it as uh, something conducing to other uh, uh, intervention of the military. And this is what happened, in fact, so in you're Mali. So you're saying that the lack of action from the likes of the African Union emboldened uh, the colonel to, it, to make the movie made? In my view, it is much more than a lack uh, uh, of action. It is, in fact, uh, a, a kind of a betrayal of the mandate, the very mandate of those organizations would have been stored to promote uh, democracy, constitutional order, and rule of law. And today, we can see that those principles are put behind uh, the interests of the different state members of those organizations, interests of state members who are also competing once against each other. Niagali, thank you very much indeed. Duda, can I bring you back in to, 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 to ask really about the, the situation regarding Alpha Conde? I mean, clearly, as Niagali was pointing out, this is a man who twisted the constitution uh, to seek another mandate, and that resulted in his downfall. Uh, I think that uh, the fact of changing the constitution, the fact of researching a third term in several counties uh, is a problem. And if you see in two countries, it is the case. Okay? Um, uh, in one country, it is a matter of fragility. Okay? But in uh, Chad and in, uh, in Guinea, it's a matter of you know, having a third term. Um, it is not yet the case in Ivory Coast, but who, who knows, in a matter of few days or few months or, or a year, what will happen. But uh, ECOWAS uh, normally would um, forbid, would forbid uh, this third term to all uh, its uh, members, member states, uh, to, 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 to seek it, because it creates instability, it creates uh, conflict uh, they have to resolve. And they, they have to do it ahead, you know, before uh, waiting that this happen and trying to, to resolve it. Uh, a coup d'etat and a coup d'etat, military coup d'etat, I would say, mm. and um, a constitutional coup d'etat, which one to condemn? I don't know. <laughs> and so are you saying that ECOWAS really should have acted Absolutely. in some way before, before. But having seen what Alpha Conde this, this was trying to point. do? Alpha Conde, long-standing leader, one-time freedom fighter, it's worth pointing out his history with the country. I mean, yeah. clearly his heart was there, but somewhere along the line, power corrupts, doesn't it, and things change? Yeah, um, People can change, you know, with power. We used to say that power uh, corrupts, you know, people. Mm. Before, they are not fond of power. But once they are in, in power, they would like to stay, you know, even if they are very old. Um, Alpha Conde is 83, okay? Uh, he should retire. But he wanted to, um, to have a set term. And this is a, the consequence is that he is uh, pushing his country into conflict. That could that will be difficult to resolve when 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 it starts. It's worthwhile pointing out that yeah. this coup has been bloodless. No one has lost their life. It's been carried out in that way. So no, they have yeah. 20, 20 military from the president, the presidential guard, who who lost their life. Twenty military from the presidential guard lost their life. Absolutely, absolutely. I was thinking in terms of civilians, but clearly, thank you for correcting that error because that's very important. Because any loss of life uh, is important. So. 20 casualties amongst the, the military. Thank you so very much indeed. Let's bring back in uh, Abu Bakr Diabe, researcher at the Guinea Political Science Association, uh, joining us uh, in the US. Uh, Abu Bakr, the, the assessment there about uh, Alpha Conde and uh, his, his desire to, to, to keep hold of power. Um, do you see this as, it's, it's not just a Guinean problem, clearly, as Niagali was pointing out, other countries, as Dudu was talking about, Ivory Coast, we've seen other places across Africa where this is almost an endemic issue. Well, thank you. This is a good question. Like, uh, let's say in the, in, the, in, the, in the last 16 years, African, African continent, African countries, most of the African countries has experienced almost 40, 42 coup d'etat as uh, the data saw. So it's very sad in Guinea 
to see that Alpha Conde, who was like uh, a prophet to bring peace, uh, like to bring development and bring stability in the region, who he became a dictator. It's very sad to see that. But the, 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 we have to analyze this aspect in two areas. The first area, Alpha Conde is from this. We from the, he's from my tribe. We came from the same, same ethnic group. But he was playing the ethnic line, the ethnic car in the country. And secondly. He was trying to, he, he tried to change the constitution to remain and die in power. So it's not like uh, Mamadi Dumbuya, he's from Alpha ethnic group. So he, he was time, that he was the right time to take over and to lead the country to the right direction. It's not about the political line. Yes, we do have that. Africa has many problems in terms of ethnic line. But the main problem here was, is it was time to move forward. You know, like uh, if you see the growing poverty in Guinea is extreme. And people don't have, uh, like, uh, the right stable life to move forward. So it was a time and a good moment to do the coup and move forward. I don't agree with the coup d'etat, but this situation was a good move for Guinea to move forward. You don't agree with so the now, coup, you don't agree with the nature of the coup, you don't agree with the, the violence of the coup, but you agree with the nature of the notion of change. That's the message I'm getting. Mm -hmm. Abu Bakr, I need Absolutely. to stop you because we need to take a very short break, but I promise you, more discussion when we come back for part two. Stay with us. Welcome back to the France 24 debate. We're examining the stakes for Guinea as the West African state starts a process of moving out of a military coup scenario into a national unity government and democratic governance in general. One thing is for sure, with 50% of the population living below the poverty line, people in Guinea are crying out for change, positive change. This report from James Andre and Conor Cree. Bonfi is one of Conakry's poorest neighborhoods. Aboubakar Keita, 28, lives here. A young father, he has to share this home with three generations of his family. There is no running water. He works as a security guard for 70 euros a month. Times are hard. Là, 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 c'est trop. Oui, ça peut être. Il y a, il y a des matinées on, dans la famille même. Il y en a qui ne gagnent pas à manger. On peut passer la journée comme ça, sans rien même dans le ventre. In Guinea, schools are due to reopen in three weeks, but this family has had to choose food over education. Abdoulaye, the elder, has lived through all the political regimes since the independence. He feels life is tougher now than ever before. The plus important for us, we want to go in front of the population of Guinea, everyone will get a little pain. That's what we want to do normally. But if we are responsible, it won't be at all. Ah, we'll see you this time. Neighborhoods like this one have been abandoned by successive governments for 60 years. This time, they hope things will be different, that they will be considered and especially offered jobs and opportunities to rise out of poverty. Sharing a house with three generations, 70 euros a month, it gives you a real sense of what poverty is like in that part of the world. James Andre, our reporter there. Let's reintroduce our guest, Niagali Bakayoko from the African Security Sector Network. Thanks for being with us, Niagali. On the other side of the studio, Dudu Sidibe, Professor of Political Science at the University of Gustave Eiffel. Great to see you. Joining us from the States, Abu Bakr Diabe, researcher at the Guinea Political Science Association. And Douglas Yates joining us too from Paris, Professor of African Studies at the American Graduate School. Um, we saw that report from James. We know what the stakes are. Nia Gali, can I start by asking you? Um, the development of Guinea from now, how important is the aspect of democracy or is just strong governance the important thing? Very good question. Uh, I think uh, one are going together uh, mm. there cannot be a real separation because I don't think that poverty is necessarily uh, conducing to uh, criminality or to uh, bad governance or to jihadism to say but of course I think that what is a uh, 
happening today more broadly in African countries is the fact that uh, the populations at large have not seen any results coming from democracy on in their daily lives. And there is a kind of distrust to uh, political elect elected leaders who have failed to, in terms of democratization, in terms of development, in terms of education, in terms of urbanization, in terms of all the promises which have been made at, for each ballot. Uh, that's a key problem in my view. The lake also of legitimacy, which is increasingly uh, expanding all over uh, African countries. So that lack of Francophone Africa, at, le at least legitimacy or credibility, the the fact that the, the the people who are trying to be in charge don't really sort of seem credible. It's one of the big issues, isn't it? I suppose. Absolutely. Now, Yigali, thank you very much, India. Let's bring in Dudu on this one. Um, the, the 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 Colonel um, Dumboya, um, very uh, practical in many ways, because whilst he imposed a curfew. Uh, on Guinea after the coup. He didn't impose that curfew around the bauxite mines. He's seen that economically it's important to keep things moving and keep the exports going. Is that kind of pragmatic approach what this country needs, do you think? Yeah, of course. I think that um, uh, the state should continue, okay? And um, also the economy should, should also uh, continue. That is why it is good to let uh, miners, investors uh, to continue um, their, their work. Uh, in order to have um, the necessary profit to elevate uh, poverty in, our, in Guinea. Um, poverty is a threat uh, to democracy uh, because um, if population are poor, they can uh, go to, to riots and um, this can create, when you, when you repress the riots, this can create a conflict. Uh, many conflicts, you know, started like that because of repression, okay? There is a... Um, a direct link between poverty. If you read Paul, Hollier, Paul Collier uh, from World Bank, uh, he, he did a, a study on that, you know. That is why it is good uh, to fight against poverty. And in Guinea, you have 44% of poor uh, population. It's a lot. I, I read that it was like 50% of people living below yeah. the poverty line. Absolutely. And it's to all people watching this internationally, of course, because this, this goes out all over the world, they'll have their own notion of what poverty is. So, for instance, where I was brought up, people were considered to be poor, but they would have social security, they'd have things to support them. Absolutely. I, I take it people in Guinea aren't going to have that kind of backing, that kind of safety net. Yeah, they, they should have all these things. They should have all these things, shouldn't they? That's, absolutely, that's absolutely. And um, they have the necessary resources for that, you know. Uh, but there is corruption. There is also what I call um, uh, bad negotiations. They were not able to negotiate, you know, really their interests okay, with multinational in order to exploit these uh, resources and get profits. Okay? And this is a problem all over Africa, you know. Uh, negotiation is of paramount importance for me, for the states. They should, you know, train their, their staff in order to negotiate their interests in several uh, domains. Dudu, thank you very much indeed. Let's go back to the states, to uh, Abu Bakr Diab, a researcher at the Guinea Political Science Association. Abu Bakr, thanks for waiting patiently uh, to have your next contribution here in part two. Uh, Trickle-down economics is kind of a phrase that's coming to mind. If, if the bauxite mines are, are opening and working, if the exports are working, then the money will come in and it will come down to the poorest people and perhaps help them. Do you think that'll work in Guinea? Well, it's not working. That's a good question. That's a good point to point uh, to, say, to mention. So the main problem in Guinea, like, uh, is a lack of leadership. Is the main problem. If there's a lack of leadership, there's no there's no way forward for for development. So in Guinea, since 1984, let's say 1984, Guinea has experienced many coup d'état and many lack of leadership. How we will think that is good time to move forward with uh, to against and you know, to fight poverty? No. So the best way, because uh, to fight poverty, you have to have a good governance. Governance is a key factor for international development. So now, what I like about Mr. Dumbuya, the the, 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 the like uh, the military gentleman, the leader of the military, he 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 read people's mind what the Guinean want, what the people want. It's not like the Guinea is divided in so many lines, but he read their mind. He said, it's time to move. It's time to fight a poor leadership. It's time to take over. And 
include people in the governance. That's the main message he's trying to send out to the people of Guinea. I think that's the good move. So Guinea has experienced lack of leadership for 25 years. So it's time to go more. It's, it's time to go forward and call the diaspora to, to come back home and do their best so that the country can take over and move forward. That's my takeaway of this uh, of this debate. Abu Bakr, thank you very much indeed. I'm getting a sense that this isn't just a lip service being paid to a process, but something that is developing. We're getting positive sounds coming uh, from, from Conakry. But as Dudu pointed out, there's positive and really positive, and that nuance is very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Let's take a listen to uh, Colonel uh, Dumboya uh, speaking uh, a few days ago, of course, uh, about this process that he wants the country to go through. It's our duty to save the country and bring the Ghanaian people together. We will put a system in place for all of the people to come together, because a political system that is not inclusive is a system that is not based on peace. Douglas, let me bring you in here. The, the Colonel uh, Dumboya, one of his uh, political heroes, or perhaps his political heroes, Jerry Rawlings of Ghana. Do you see that as a good sign? No, I'm, I'm afraid I'm an opponent of military rule. Um, the, the fact of the matter is the colonel uh, doesn't uh, understand the international system. There might be a change of leadership in Guinea, but nothing has changed outside. Guinea just borrowed $20 billion from China. Xi Jinping is still in office. That money is going to go to bauxite mines and an aluminum ref alumina refinery, but that's going to take years for that money to translate into revenue. So he's not going to have any revenue from that unless he steals. The rest of the money is an IMF standby agreement, and the IMF is going to require he balances his budget, he increase taxes, he stops subsidy for food, petrol, and electricity, or that money is cut. And it was precisely those policies that made Alpha Conde unpopular. So either he becomes a, a kleptocrat and steals money, or he attempts to implement the policies that will saw the branch that he is sitting on. Either way, uh, th this uh, regime will end as it started. So the situation, Douglas, as you're pointing it out to us, it, it looks like... It, being between a rock and a hard place would actually be a good thing. This seems to be a lot worse than that. Yeah, well, the fact of the matter is nothing fundamentally has changed for Guinea because they've changed leaders. Uh, the corruption is endemic. Apart from the, the failure of distribution, we're just speaking macroeconomically. Guinea has minerals. 60% of its population grows food. To produce those minerals, it takes time. They will generate revenues, but those revenues are insufficient for Guinea's development needs. The rest is financed on debt. And by the way, the way they're developing those minerals is $20 billion in new debt to China which will only make them more in arrears, make it more difficult for them to balance their budget. Indeed, Chinese influence is, is one way, one thing we've debated here many times, that the Chinese are growing influence across Africa. Douglas, thank you very much indeed as ever. Douglas Yates uh, from the American Graduate School here in Paris. Uh, here in the studio, Niagali Bakayoko of the African Security Net Sector Network, Dudu Sidibe of Gustav Eiffel University, and Abu Bakr Diabe uh, joining us from the States, researcher at the Guinea Political Science Association. Abu Bakr, can I bring you in on this one? Um, do you share the, the, the pessimism that we heard there from uh, Douglas Yates, uh, Abu Bakr? Tell us what you think uh, over there in the US. Abu Bakr Diaby, go ahead, please, sir. Yes, you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We lost your vision for a while, sir, but I can see you now over my shoulder, which is very reassuring. Yes. <laughs> and please, you've got the floor. Please speak to us. Well, I definitely agree. I definitely share the panel view. You know, they have uh, pointed out many issues African is facing and most of the, you know, Guinea particularly is facing. Yes, there is a hope. There is a hope if we have a good governance. There is a hope if we have a sense of understanding that democracy is not a Western value. Democracy is a universal value. Because most of the people in Africa, even the population, they don't get it. Democracy, what is about democracy? So democracy is not just the, the, the European and the American value. It's a Western value. So in order to understand that, it's time to move forward for the Guinea people. But like, guard governance is the factor. I agree, actually, most of the area the panel pointed out, but guard governance and good leadership will be the key for Guinea to move forward in the 21st century. 
Thank you, Abba Barker. We call this the debate, but I think there's no real debate here. I think everybody wants what's best for Guinea. That's, that's the main thing, isn't it? And everybody, it's a question of how that works, I suppose. So, Nia Gali, can I bring you in again to talk about, well, well, to ask you, in these discussions going ahead now in Guinea, what is the most important thing, do you think? I mean, clearly the dialogue is important. Clearly the idea of laying down this path to democracy is important. Clearly strong leadership is important too. What would you say is the, the essential thing from your perspective that needs to be hit upon to make this work? Uh, from my own point of view, I definitely think that to have good governance, you also have to have good governance in the security sector. And to have it, it is absolutely crucial to change the approach we have to this security sector. Because as we can see, when you look, uh, for instance, at uh, Mamadi Dumbuya background, uh, you can see that he has been trained in a lot of uh, uh, Western or Eastern France, uh, yeah. France, but not only uh, Israel, mm -hmm. uh, also uh, other countries. And I think today, not only in, in Guinea, but everywhere uh, in, in Afri Francophone Africa, there there is a real need to depart from those approaches based on only on training and on reinforcing operational capabilities to fight. There is a need also to focus on the good governance, on transparency, on accountability of the democratic, of the security apparatuses as well, and also on the way in which they are also uh, taught how to uh, show respect to human rights. And those two dimensions are directly missing from all the, <laughs> the approaches that international uh, community has tried to push uh, to make professional military uh, to, to be reformed. Of course, you have also the UNDP, who has been involved in very deep reform uh, in, uh, in Guinea uh, to help the military uh, to change. But we can see that it is a total failure. So in my view, there is a need to change the operational approach to a security approach based on governance, democratic governance. Democratic governance, Dudu, I, I, can, I can imagine you're agreeing with that, but give us it in your words. Yeah, I agree with her, um, because uh, without a good governance, um, Guinea cannot achieve uh, its goals, okay? Uh, but I think that um, it's not only about leadership. Leadership, yes, but also to build strong institutions okay um, because without instru strong institutions you know um, the leaders can do whatever they like while, while ruling okay um, I, I think that we have to to rethink the political system in in Africa uh, we should not let only one person decide on everything we should have a kind of check and balance you know in all the system in order to oblige the president to negotiate Okay. I would say like a, a, a polyarchic system um, uh, in order to negotiate different bodies of power would negotiate in order to take a decision. And I imagine the decision would be the best because it is uh, negotiated uh, by uh, several stakeholders. It's my point of, uh, of view. When you said that word about not entrusting it to one man, I, I went to my notes and remember that uh, Colonel Dubois said, we will no longer entrust politics to one man, we entrust it to the people. Exactly. Which are great words, but yeah, absolutely. do those words mean anything? Does, does, does he mean, I mean, I suppose we'll, we'll see what happens, but yeah. it's easy to say, it's difficult to do. Yeah, in Guinea, they, they are called um, people of Guinea, the people of Guinea. It's the only uh, country I, I, I could hear that, you know. What does it mean? It means that they focus on people, you know, theoretically, but practically uh, the leaders do not implement it, okay? They should let the people uh, convey uh, their ideas, um, their feeling, okay? Uh, give them the, 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 the liberty, the, the capabilities in order to achieve their, their dream of getting out of poverty. And I think that they can do it. This is fantastic stuff, Dudu. Thank you. Douglas Yates, can I bring you in? Uh, because it sounds like what we're calling for here from our panel, uh, I'm, I'm sure you will agree, but you'll have a take on this. And that's why we love having you on the programme. Uh, Douglas Yates, the, the idea 
that we're hearing of, of changing something for the people is obviously one thing. It is the big problem that the politicians uh, in the past and perhaps in the future usually have their own interests first and then the, those are the people second? Well, yes. The, the, all of the measures of corruption and and the perception of corruption show that it is endemic at, at every level of Guinean society. So as long as you've got a system where resources are diverted, uh, they're unlikely to reach um, the, the people. So what, what you've got is a new government that is going to soon face a cash crisis, a money crisis, and it only has a few places to go. Private banks, rich Western countries, or China and Russia. And, uh, and that's it. And, uh, and it's only got really one kind of thing to offer, and those are minerals. So uh, the new rulers might um, be able to offer symbolic gestures of legitimacy, like releasing prisoners and reopening the headquarters of the opposition campaign and holding talks. But when you're looking at the bottom line of when their money, where their money's going to come from, they're going to have to implement austerity, and that's going to undermine any legitimacy that they can build with populist measures. Ultimately, military rule, unless it's a regime of exception, a temporary measure waiting for elections will be illegitimate, will become a tyranny. Doug, Douglas, I'm, I'm, they, Douglas, I'm listening to you, and you make sense. Uh, you make very, very, you make a lot of sense with everything you say. But I'm kind of wondering, how much more austere can it be, given people are living in such dire poverty? What's happened is mineral prices have gone up because COVID stopped, but at the same time, food prices have gone up. And, uh, and therefore, fuel prices have gone up. And all of the things Guinea uh, can't provide for itself have increased. So either the government subsidizes those prices for the poor and then goes into deficit and goes into debt, or the government cuts those subsidies and then we have popular protests or another coup d'etat. Douglas Yates, thank you very much indeed. Let's go to the United States. Abu Bakr Diaby uh, of the Guinea Political Science Association. Abu Bakr, uh, you heard what Douglas had to say. Um, I'm wondering uh, how you're feeling about the coming, the upcoming, the talks that have begun, the developments that are going to happen. Uh, are you feeling positive now uh, at this point in our debate about what happens next for your country? Yes, of course. Still, Still positive, yeah? Positive. Yeah, of course. Yes, Good. I can definitely say that. Well, let's say Guinea is a very rich, just poorly managed in the past. That's the one. That's main point. That's the. Uh, that's the. That's, uh, like the main point. Actually, what we have. Uh, what happening actually in Guinea? The second element, the most important element, I will say, Colonel Dumbuya right now deserves a chance. People support him. Let him show what he's capable of. Simple like as that. Do you see him as being the leader? Because clearly what we're looking at, or what, as I, I presume, what we're trying to see in Guinea is some kind of transition between towards the people making the choice of who rules, rather than an army man saying, I'm in command. Well, 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 well that's not the case. He's trying to put in place the transitional regime. It's not like he's going to stay in power like Alpha Conde did and change the constitution. He's trying to put in place a good governance and a constitution. There's no governance without a good constitution. That's the key factor. So now it's time for him, like he said at the beginning, when he took over with his team, he said that it's time to put in place a good governance. Without a good constitution, there's no governance. So what Guinea did actually right now, we need an inclusive society where law, rule of law, and a strong constitution are a key a, a, a element for Guinea people. That's my understanding. Well, here's to that, and let's hope that is respected. Final comment to you, Nia Gali, about um, what happens next. If you could basically wave a magic wand and make it happen, what would it be? I, I agree that uh, the question of rule of law is absolutely crucial, as uh, my colleague was saying, and to build strong institutions is key. But there is also a need for all stakeholders to show respect to those legal frameworks. That's absolutely indispensable. And until we cannot reach this situation, mm. I think uh, we will stay in the 
kind of cycle which was described by Douglas uh, with uh, unconstitutional changes of uh, constitution and then military coups. Thank you. I'm stealing another 10 seconds for you, Dudu. Your final word. Yeah, my final word is I'm wondering how, how much time, you know, um, the transition will last, okay? Uh, maybe the, the shorter is, is the better for me, okay? Maybe one year and a half maximum. Dudu, thank you much indeed. My producers now tell me we are out of time, so I apologise for overrunning, but I had to get these guests to get their final words. Nia Gali of the African Security Sector Network, thank you. Uh, Dudu Sidibe of uh, the University of Gustav Eiffel, thank you very much indeed. Thanks to Abu Bakr uh, in the States there at the Guinea Political Science Association, and thanks to Douglas Yates here in Paris at the American Graduate School. Thank you for watching. Stay with us. You're watching France 24.